All right, I'm recording. Okay, so you guys are officially being recorded. Uh, sorry, uh, it's, it's one of the disclaimers in my syllabus, uh, in case you didn't know that. Okay, so uh, one thing I want to point out is that if you have need to actually join us via Zoom, uh, there's like a permanent Zoom link right here at the top. I've kind of made the syllabus the home page for the course, okay? Um, so there's a permanent Zoom link sitting right there. You could always click on that and, and join via Zoom if, if uh, for whatever reason you need to quarantine, not necessarily because of COVID, but for whatever reason, okay? So um, there you go with that. Uh, the, you know, it's basically my own personal like meeting uh, URL. That's essentially what's linked right there. If you click on it, you'll actually see the meeting ID. Uh, if you learn stuff about Zoom, which I'm sure that you have over the last several months, or at least some of you have, there's a little meeting ID that's kind of the key to, to getting into a meeting, okay? Uh, I will also, as you can see right here, so people that are joining us via Zoom, um, you know, uh, if I'm sharing the screen, we'll kind of be over here on the side. Uh, Zoom etiquette is typically to mute oneself when you're in there until you actually have a question and then just feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask a question. Now, sometimes people like to put a little hand raise thing. I can't guarantee I'm going to see that, but if you, if you just kind of unmute yourself and say something, um, you know, I'll try to be sensitive to hear that. I'm, again, I'm going to try to stay fairly anchored to, uh, to the desk here. Um, what else about Zoom? Well, um, again, I'll record these things. I'll probably make a YouTube channel eventually once I get enough videos that have enough content. Uh, but, but I think that's, that's probably it. Any questions on that? Any questions on the whole Zoom uh, tech aspect of what's going on here? Anything? All right, so uh, you may or may not be aware, but we're starting a little bit earlier than we normally do, and uh, we're not having any breaks. It's just straight through, right? Nothing. Uh, we're just gonna try to get it all in and be done by Thanksgiving. That's the goal. Uh, you'll have an extra long break between uh, you know, finals, you'll go, uh, it will literally be Thanksgiving because uh, you'll be done with finals, right? And the semester will be done, which will be great. Um, you'll have the end of November, all of December, and even the first week or so of January, uh, which is, I think, fantastic. I think it's a great plan. Um, again, we meet three times a week in this room, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 a.m. And uh, I just want to kind of read through. I don't know if you can see this very well. Um, hopefully you can. Uh, course introduces freshman math majors to interesting mathematical ideas and applications beyond the usual scope of standard math courses. Topics include an introduction to propositional logic, function theory, and infinite sets. Those three topics will essentially be what we'll be talking about for like the first week or so. Okay, we'll be asking ourselves, what is a function? sort of have a philosophical discussion about that, okay? In your mind right now, a function might be some kind of, you know, two-dimensional graphical representation where you have a real number corresponding to another real number and you plot ordered pairs of points and you get like a graph, right? That's typically what you have seen in kind of a high school paradigm, okay? Or even if you've taken uh, calculus, uh, that's the essence of what a function is there. What, the, what that is, though, is sort of a specific uh, instance of what a function is, generally speaking. Functions in general are very abstract. And so we'll kind of talk about that and, and where we see functions come up. And that will kind of lead us naturally into uh, the realm of, of propositional logic. Um, a lot of you probably have seen things like logic tables in the past, you know, where you have like different combinations of trues and falses and things like that. And you have variables 
that can either take on the value of true and false, and you have ands and ors in there as well. The and and the or are really like the two basic uh, logical connectives, but there are other logical connectives that are built upon those things. So yeah, sorry guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually mute this bad boy. Actually, what in the world? Sorry. Well, it is what it is. So uh, infinite sets is another thing that kind of comes up naturally in the context of function theory. Um, you actually use functions to count things. You can use functions to count things. You can use functions to count finite sets, for instance. So if I give you a set of like five teddy bears, Really what you've done in your mind, and you like say, well, there's five teddy bears right there. Believe it or not, you have actually, I mean, you may not realize this, it's kind of bizarre, but you've actually created a function from the set of counting numbers to the bears. What you've done is you've kind of imagined the bears being lined up right there, and you've said, okay, one goes to this first bear, two goes to the second bear, three goes to the third bear, four to the fourth, and five to the fifth. Five goes to the fifth bear. Does that make sense? So that set of five bears, you've built kind of a function that tells you how many there are. It's like a counting function of some kind. Okay? But what happens if a set doesn't have like a finite number of elements in it? Yeah, what if it just goes on forever? Uh, can, we do, can we use functions to help us count those and keep track of how large they are? And the answer is yes. Okay? And this is fairly controversial even back like 100 years ago, right? Uh, there was a mathematician by the name of, of Georg Cantor. Okay? He's a Russian mathematician. And he, uh, he actually was the first one to look rigorously at the concept of infinite sets and trying to see okay, if I'm talking about an infinite set, what am I really talking about? Can I actually measure the size of this thing? Are there more than uh, one level of infinity? The answer is yes, okay? You wanna talk about these things rigorously, it turns out if you use functions to help you count the, so count the size of infinite sets, uh, you end up figuring out that there are different sizes of infinity. So we'll look at that together, okay? Other topics will be chosen from elementary number theory, uh, modular arithmetic and error correcting codes, right? So if, if Dr. Fry was teaching this class, he'd probably spend all his time on, on error correcting codes. He's like, he, he's like loves error correcting codes, right? I don't know that I'll do that. I'll probably spend most of my time uh, talking about like uh, RSA, which is a encryption decryption scheme, which is built on the back of number theory. And so that will kind of show you that probably the worst question that you can ask in, ma in mathematics is, well, what's this useful for? Because there was a whole realm of number theoretic mathematics that developed hundreds of years ago. And a lot of people were asking that question back then. They were saying, what, what in the world is all this abstract nonsense you're doing with, with integers? What, what good is that? And then lo and behold, 200 years later, guess what? All of that abstract number theoretic mathematics was the foundation upon which uh, encryption, you know, uh, internet security was built, okay? Someone just had a good idea of how to put those things into practice and there it was. Um, so one thing you'll learn, I hope, as, as math majors, and especially in this class, is it's okay to ask what's this good for? but you don't necessarily have to see the application right now. Does that make sense? <laughs> you don't have to see the application while you're alive, okay? You might die, but the stuff's written down, and then someone else 200 years later might go, oh man, look at look how that's useful. And in the end, all we really care is that it, is that it glorifies the Lord, and, and that may not ne necessitate some human application anyways, okay? So, uh, we'll look at number theory, and that will involve our looking at number modular arithmetic. And I'm primarily going to be interested in moving us toward trying to understand how RSA works, because that's that's one of a that's a really neat application. 
Fibonacci numbers and the golden ratio, okay? Um, the, that's all over the place. I'll probably, even though it doesn't say it in here, I'll probably spend some time on, on another collection of numbers called the Catalan numbers. Anybody ever heard of those? The Catalan numbers, okay? Uh, they are just all over the place, just like the Fibonacci numbers, okay? And the golden ratio is related to it, the ratio of consecutive Fibonacci numbers. Fractals, okay, even, even Elsa knows what those are, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. Elsa from Frozen, okay? Uh, you know, she says Frozen fractals, right? So all around in, in her famous song from the first Frozen movie. Okay, uh, we'll talk a little bit about discrete dynamical systems and chaos, all right? Because uh, we, we do have a class that's an upper division class that, that is specifically focused on dynamical systems and chaos. But, um, but it's good to just kind of get used to dynamical systems, discrete dynamical systems. There's a, uh, there's a way that you look for things called fixed points or equilibrium points. And there's a, there's a technique called cobwebbing that helps you understand how these discrete dynamical systems are working. We'll look at that. And then we'll go into the realm of graph theory. Um, Euler and Hamilton circuits are a, an important aspect of graph theory. And by the way, it's not graphs like what you drew in high school, okay? When I talk about graph theory, uh, it's like vertices, which are just points, and lines between them, which we call edges. Generally speaking, there you can use graphs to represent information in a very concrete, basic way. And then you start asking questions about, okay, if I want to know something about the situation I'm in, what does that question translate to if I'm, ta if I'm thinking about a graph? Yeah? Okay. And uh, Euler and Hamilton circuits are an important aspect of graph theoretic um, uh, problem solving. Okay, and then we'll talk about voting theory, which you, you wouldn't think that that would be uh, something that math would, would be involved with. But I mean, you go talk to political scientists that go to graduate school, they, they all of a sudden start saying, man, everything in like advanced political science is mathematics. It's all math. What is going on, right? And it turns out that voting theory is very mathematical. There's, uh, you know, there's uh, some things we'll talk about in terms of like, what does it mean for voting to be fair? Okay, we'll talk about something called fair division also. Um, so like, you know, it's almost like a game theory type thing where I say, okay, we're gonna try to divide up the spoil from this war that we just won or something, right? How in the world can we do that in like a fair and equitable way? Uh, for, for one person, uh, something might be more uh, valuable to them than it is to you, for instance. Does that make sense? So fair division is kind of the study of dividing up things in a way that seems fair and equitable. There's an impossibility theorem related to voting theory called, uh, it's called Arrow's Paradox. Because what, what you'll do is, is in voting theory, you say, okay, for voting to be fair, I want this, 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 and this to have happened. And then it turns out you can't do it. <laughs> So like any voting system that you sort of come up with uh, can't simultaneously address all of those things. It's called Eros Paradox. I already mentioned game theory. Um, we'll look at some other game theoretic things. There's some games that I'll probably look at specifically. Uh, one uh, like NIM, for instance. We might talk about NIM. Um, we'll talk about the platonic solids, get into geometry a little bit. We'll talk about in-dimensional space. And, and other topics at my discretion. Um, I might even talk about things like, so since, it's in, since, uh, since I like probability and combinatorics, I might talk about uh, something called the stable marriage problem, um, which is something that, that uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about and that I think most people should be aware of. Right? John's sitting there and uh, Maybe, I don't know, he might be excited, but he might also be disappointed that I just said that because he's thought about that quite a bit as well. Okay. Uh, like I said, my name is Adam Hammett. 
Um, I'm not going to go through all of these like course learning outcomes, uh, but just know that this is for me, there's like a really complicated linked version of the course learning outcomes that uh, are linked right there. <laughs> it's, it's just more for the university to track what's happening with, the, with their courses. This is basically what we're going for right here, though. These are the things we're trying to accomplish um, that kind of keep us uh, staying the course. Um, there's a few books. Uh, the, the kind of main textbook is called The Heart of Mathematics, An Invitation to Effective Thinking. Now, um, some people might say, hey, you're a math major, right? What on earth are you going to do with that? A better question is, like, they just tend to think, okay, well, they're going to go teach or something like that, right? Uh, a better question is, what can't you do with it, right? Uh, there's, there's just... What it does in mathematics is you learn how to think, not just about mathematics, but about everything, okay? You learn, I think it's, it's hugely helped me to think about theology and theological systems. It's helped me uh, think about, you know, uh, logic in the realm of computer science, okay? It's, it's hugely helped me there. I mean, I've, I've noticed that I'm very quickly able to kind of pick up on things uh, more so than someone that is only focusing on computer science. Um, it helps me think about even like relationship dynamics and things like that. There are just certain logical aspects that you can apply there. Uh, it's, it's really been surprising to me, the older I get, how math is so portable. Lots of people go to graduate school in other areas other than mathematics after getting a math degree. People go to medical school, they go to law school. In fact, my brother-in-law was studying for the law school admissions test and he was a pre-law major and he came to me and he goes, Hey man, I don't know how to do any of these problems. What is going on? And they were all logic problems. <laughs> the ones that he didn't know how to do. And I was like, Oh, you just do this. And it was actually fun for me to kind of play around with that. And it turns out that, uh, mathematicians score higher than like everybody else on the law school admissions test. The same thing happens with the so-called GMAT, which is like the, uh, uh, the you know, business admissions test, right? It's kind of like the GRE for business. So math is a super portable degree. Uh, when I was an undergraduate math major, I got hired by a software development company. I wasn't even a I wasn't even a computer science major. I got hired by a software development company to kind of write code and things like that. And I didn't, I didn't know that much about code, but they, they hired me because I was a, because I was a math person. <laughs> and there were just certain things that that brought to the table that being a pure computer science major did not bring. Okay. So when we look at the heart of mathematics, uh, that's, that's what this textbook is, is trying to get at. It's trying to show you, look, what this is really about is learning how to think well, okay? And, and so in this book, we look at topics that, that are helpful to that end. Um, there's a couple of awesome books I'm gonna have us look at. I haven't quite decided exactly how to incorporate them, uh, but one of them is Flatland, kind of a classic, it was written in the 1800s, and it's, it's kind of like a, um, Oh, I don't know. It's, it's a little tale about a world that's actually two-dimensional. There's like a whole society that's set up in two-dimensional space. Basically, status in that society is determined by the number of sides that you have. Everybody's like a shape, okay? And uh, so like the priestly class, which are like the upper echelon of that society, like have so many sides that, uh, that they look circular in nature, right? And you're just really low on the totem pole if, if you're just a triangle, okay? That's pretty, uh, pretty bad. Uh, you're ba you basically are kind of subjugated to like a soldier service type class in this particular society they set up. And what happens is there's, there's one person that's kind of telling the story. His name is A period square, or it's actually Arthur square. Uh, but A square is kind of how it's, he's uh, referred to throughout the book. 
And it turns out that he is visited by a being from a higher dimension, namely three dimensions. And it's, it's difficult for him to kind of grasp this third dimension. And, and they have this like kind of on, ongoing dialogue, him and this visitor, he's accused of heresy for like espousing this, you know, weird uh, mysticism uh, about some like higher dimension or something. Uh, but it's a great book. Uh, it kind of explores the realm of, uh, explores the topic of higher dimensions in kind of an interesting way. I think every mathematician should have to read it. Super cheap though, um, that's always a good thing. And by the way, if you wanna save money, like the heart of mathematics, I mean, you can always get a used copy, but I think you could also get like a loose leaf version of it if you were so inclined. Uh, my, my copy is loose leaf. That's fine. You just have to know that there's the chance that it might kind of tear a little bit or something um, over time because it's like in a three ring binder. Uh, and the book that I think is the most awesome book of the ones that we're going to be looking at is, is called Journey Through Genius. And what it is, is it's kind of like a historical, uh, it, it, it goes through the historical timeline of mathematics. It goes all the way back to ancient Greece, and it kind of put, picks out uh, like really important, interesting developments that took place in mathematics. And there are specific theorems. A theorem is, is something that has been proven, and it's kind of a big deal thing that's been proven. And it focuses in on like a particular mathematician and a particular theorem that they happen to stumble upon, okay, in their, in their work. And so what it does is it kind of gives you a lay of the land of, of the historical landscape of mathematics, but also some of the great results that happened along the way. I think that this is a, a beautiful math is a place where we can really explore some historical themes. Uh, what I've typically done is I have, I've sort of delivered the first um, talk, if you will, on a chapter. We'll probably do like a chapter a week sort of thing. Um, almost. I think there's probably about 10 chapters or 11 chapters in the book. Probably won't do one this week, but next week I will probably uh, do the first chapter. Um, I'll, I'll get more specific in here and, and tell you what I'm expecting you to read. I'll have a reading list of some kind, but um, I still have to kind of think that through a little bit more carefully. Uh, we'll go through the first chapter. The first chapter is on someone named uh, uh, Hippocrates, okay? And uh, what he did is he, um, he made a leap in the direction of something called squaring the circle, which is basically, how do I construct, like if someone gives me a circle, how do I construct with compass and straight edge a square that has the exact same area as that circle? But I can only use compass and straight edge. That's called squaring the circle. There was something uh, deeper going on behind the scenes as to why they were interested in doing that. There was something really regular and normal about that if they were able to pull that off. And the Greeks could not figure out how to square the circle. They were like, how in the world is this gonna happen? What Hippocrates did is he squared something called a loon, a loon. Okay, what does that sound like if I, if I say loon? I know it's a bird, but it sounds like lunar, right? Okay, so basically he squared something that looked kind of like a crescent moon. And the Greeks were like, oh man, uh, we're getting close to actually squaring the circle. But then unfortunately, uh, you know, 2,300 years later, still no one could square the circle. And then finally, uh, just this, you know, this past century, someone proved that it's impossible. You can't square the circle, okay? Uh, which is also fairly satisfying, I guess. Um, but uh, at least there's an answer there, right? Namely that you can't square the circle. So those are the sorts of things that are in Journey Through Genius. I'll, I'll probably do the first uh, the first talk on squaring the uh, squaring the loon, Hippocrates square. It's called quadrature of the loon. <laughs> okay, Hippocrates and the quadrature of the loon. But it'll go all the way through. We'll we'll see people like Leonard Euler, Isaac Newton, uh, some really interesting characters like uh, Niccolo Cardano, Italian mathematician. 
Uh, we'll see Gior Cantor, who I've already mentioned uh, once before, um, and others. Uh, all the famous mathematicians of uh, Gauss. We'll look at Gauss as well. He's a pretty famous mathematician. Uh, there's results from each one of those mathematicians and kind of the context surrounding how they came up with that. Okay. Um, the grading, and incidentally, this is, this is all of, some of this is like subject to change. Uh, we will have an in-class examination just on course material that we happen to cover. That'll happen in early October, so we have some time there. Uh, there'll be a second exam in mid, early to mid-November, and then probably an ex a paper, maybe an exam uh, due kind of at the end of the term, and then there's actually going to be a final exam and that happens on Monday, November 23rd, okay? Um, I have this, our, this like vague category of response papers and other work worth 19%, okay? Uh, response papers could be things I ask you to write up about the reading, be it like a response paper to Flatland or, or maybe a response paper to a particular chapter that we read out of Journey Through Genius or just something in, uh, in the Heart of Mathematics book. Could be any of those things or I might have you present in groups right I might have you present in groups on a chapter or something like that um, I've, I've done some variety of all of those so I'm just trying to give myself some considerable flexibility there the other thing that you're going to be doing is um, going to, to math talks okay uh, there's a course at the end of the math major called capstone which is like a research focused course in a particular area. The students prepare uh, talks on a particular topic and they deliver them. Usually they're, you know, 20, 25 minutes or so. And part of the expectation, uh, one of the expectations of beautiful math is that you go to some talks, math talks, and just get used to that. But we're, we're going to have a lot of math talks in here. One thing you're going to learn how to do is, is how to give a good math talk. I don't know if I'm a good example of that or not, but I've at least seen enough math talks that have been good, and, and I'm just trying to copy those guys, right? Uh, but we're going to kind of learn how to get comfortable talking about mathematics, the sorts of things you ought to be focusing on, because a lot of times I've seen a lot of bad math talks too, believe me. You can tend to focus on the wrong sorts of things and deliver bad math talks too, okay? So we're going to, we're going to, um, we're going to observe talks and we're going to give talks and that will be that will be helpful for us all for sure okay um i want to pause any any questions so far questions okay Two. So let me, let me count that again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And then there's two people that I just signed in. I think everybody is here, I think. Um, so that's good. But any questions so far? Questions? Yes. Would you recommend a computer or a uh, I'm not going to require you to have a computer. I will do some, obviously, I mean, <laughs> We're sort of strapped to technology right now as far as instruction of the course goes. I will demonstrate some things with my computer, but I'm not expecting you to have a computer necessarily. Um, I would just, I would take notes either in a notebook or if you, you know, you're doing it on like a tablet or something, that's fine as well. Or if, <laughs> if you already know like LaTeX or something and you're typing things out, or if you want to type notes or whatever you want to do, it's just totally up to you. But, um, Take notes by hand, take notes on a tablet. It's all, it's all up to you. Yes, sir. If I have you turn in an assignment, I'm gonna have you upload it as a PDF file in Canvas. So typically what I will do is, is there's like an assignments tab. Let me see here. It'll look different for you, but if you go like to an assignments tab, I'll, I'll have all of the assignments in there kind of listed chronologically as they materialize over time, okay? And I will have uh, on that assignment um, a link for you to kind of upload upload your, your homework. Does that make sense? Or whatever it is I've asked for. That way, 
You're not sitting around like waiting for me to get it back to you or something, you just have it, right? And I will actually grade it in there. I'll make comments and things like that and, and we'll see what sorts of things I, had, I took issue with or whatever. I'll do that in Canvas itself. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, what else? Look, I'm, I'm not gonna go through tons of stuff, uh, tons of this stuff down here. You can just kind of read it on your own. Uh, a lot of it feel, I always feel mean when I read my own policies. I promise you I'm not this mean, uh, but I just have to kind of make things clear, right? Uh, please just, I don't, I don't give extra credit. I mean, you can come ask me, but I'll probably just say no. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, you could, you could come and ask, okay? But I'll probably just say no. But you can still come and ask, right? We can have a conversation about that. But generally speaking, if I give an individual an opportunity for extra credit, I, I would feel compelled uh, for the sake of justice and mercy at the same time to, to give extra credit opportunity to everyone. So, I mean, you could ask and I could, I could sort of think about, okay, well, is there something that I could let everybody participate in, right? Um, but generally extra credit is not, is not something that's kind of a part of, of, uh, of the course. Um, there's some statements on academic integrity um, on you know the Cove and the Writing Center, on information technology, and then there's this COVID policy. Um, I know that you guys have been coached ad nauseum about uh, current COVID policy and whatnot, I'm sure, um, via emails and in other venues as well. Uh, but this is just straight copied and pasted from the um, you know university. Um, uh, university recommendations. Now, notice down here it says, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the syllabus is provisional and applicable only to the fall 2020 semester. Any and all policies and requirements are subject to change without notice as health conditions on campus may change abruptly, okay? So, I mean, just know that, I mean, the syllabus isn't really like, it's not a legally binding contract. This is just kind of my promise to you as a student, right? I mean, uh, there, are, there are times when syllabi will be used in like a court of law or something, but you know, I'm trying to put a disclaimer on here just, just so that you know, this is sort of uncertain times, we may have to change course from time to time, okay? Now, uh, I do have kind of a roughed out schedule here at the bottom, and notice I put rough in italics, yeah? and subject to change in italics, yes, uh, because what this is, is it's kind of, it's me thinking through what I'm going to do in the course, okay? This is literally my lesson plan daily for the entire course, okay? And now look, that, those aren't my lecture notes, because that would be not very much lecture notes, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, so like August 17, that's today, intro stuff, talk about functions. I've already kind of talked about functions a little bit, yes? I will continue to talk about functions uh, on Wednesday. I don't know if we're gonna have time to really get into the nitty gritty about functions today, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more about functions and sets, whatever those are, okay? That will be a topic of conversation on Wednesday and something called power sets as well. But you can kind of, if you, you know, if you are so, Find notice right here. I, I said at some point that I would talk about RSA codes. Yes, you can see that right there on September the second is something that I'm planning on on talking about. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time on propositional logic and what it means to give a valid argument. Okay, we'll even talk about some philosophical fallacies that people tend to make when they when they actually are trying to make an argument. Uh, mathematicians, in the end, are kind of proof machines. Uh, we have to know how to, how to, uh, you know, what it means to make a valid argument, and we'll have several techniques that we'll use. And we'll also know how to detect when it is that we actually don't have a proof. We have some kind of circular logic going on or something like that. Okay? We've assumed what we're trying to prove, and we'll codify that in symbols that's what uh, predicate logic is. It's kind of a symbolized version of logic to try to make, help us understand what's happening. 
okay? All right, so you can read down through here and you'll see, I mean, I, I even have some stuff about problems that I wanna work through. From time to time, I'm not gonna collect homework in here out of the Heart of Mathematics book, but I will assign problems for you to work on, okay? Uh, what I will be primarily interested in collecting uh, are like reflection papers, things like that, okay, on, on some of the readings. Uh, but don't, don't horse around. Uh, if I tell you to work on some homework problems, do it, okay? And come and come to my office hours, ask questions. Oh, and by the way, uh, there was a link up here to office hours. Um, where was that? Somewhere. Oh, right here. So this is office hours. One thing that's a little bit annoying about this is if you click on it, it goes, uh, for some reason, by default, it goes to like the summer term. You have to go to fall and you have to search for my name and then you'll see it. But I'm also gonna put my schedule outside my door, but it's simple. Uh, every day at two o'clock, I'll be in my office, okay? For sure. If you, if you need a different time to discuss things, that's fine. And I will also kind of, um, during my office hours, I'll, I'll also have Zoom open, kind of like what I'm doing here. If you wanna Zoom in, you can do that as well. Okay, so every day, two o'clock, okay? You can pop over to the office, ask questions. You can pop into Zoom uh, if you are so inclined, and I would be happy to help you, okay? All right, um, and, uh, just in the future, I mean, I, I would much rather use this but I'm, I'm probably going to end up just, I'm gonna use up, I'm gonna use the whiteboard iPad, right? So long as we have um, some people kind of zooming in, I'm probably gonna use that. And that way it will show up in the video that I post later and things like that. And uh, it will just be better, a okay, better, better quality. Uh, you'll be able to see everything right here. We'll also keep what I put on the board uh, efficient, like in terms of, I can only fill up that amount of space right there. And I would ha have to move on to another board. Um, etc. I tried messing with this owl thing, <coughs> which is this. I don't know if you guys can see that on Zoom. I don't like it. It's just, it's too, uh, it doesn't respond quick enough. It pays attention to the wrong sorts of things. In a math class where there's like lots of questions and interactions happening, like a class, a class like this, it's like, it, it just is really having a hard time keeping up. Um, <laughs> it tends to hear things like someone dropping a pencil or clanking their coffee cup or something, right? I'm not gonna use it. Some people might use it. I just don't know that it really lends itself well to, to a math class. I'm just going to use my iPad and <clears throat> in Zoom on my laptop, okay? Other questions? <coughs> So when you said uh, when you said the off, for the office hours we could uh, come in with Zoom, would that be the same link as yes? Uh, okay. Yes, the exact same link. That's a permanent link to anything involving uh, Dr. Hammett. Okay, so I will I will open Zoom, <clears throat> and and by the way, if I like forget, and you come in, John. Um, it will send me a notification. And so I'll know that you're on there. Does that make sense? <laughs> it sends me a notification and then I'll, I'll say, oh man, and then I'll, I'll go in there, okay? Other questions? Just walk in, yeah. I know some, I know some professors are like, well, I'm only doing Zoom office hours. I, I'm, not, I'm not too concerned about that, just as long as we're, um, you know, abiding by university policy, I'm fine. Yeah, you can just show up and, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about stuff. So two o'clock every day, except Saturday and Sunday, Monday through Friday, okay? Okay, what else? Other questions? Sir? Right, so office hours go till th three, two to three every day. But I'll probably be there later. So, sir. What do you recommend we get the dorms back? Um, as soon as possible. Uh, so 
Yeah, get the books probably by the, hopefully, you know, hopefully you'll have them by the end of this week because I'll have some reading assignments for you. And I'm, I'm going to be lecturing out of chapter one the last two days of this week. Um, but the, uh, like I said, probably a week from Friday, I'll do a lecture on Hippocrates and the quadrature of the loom. Um, and then we'll be off and running. So, so by the end of this week, for sure, make sure you have the, the appropriate materials. What else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And if you come, I don't, do you have class at three? Yeah, class at three. Okay. You have a class at four? Well, I mean, yeah, just if you come, I, cause I'm, I'm done teaching it to, I'm usually around till five. So yeah. And if, if you're, if you're wanting to zoom in for whatever reason, um, you can either send me an email or you can just click that permanent link and it will send me a notification and I could just jump on. Does that make sense? And, and I, I'm, I, I can actually jump on even like from my phone, for instance. And I've had to do that too uh, from time to time. Just do that. There's a, I don't know if you guys know, but there's a study room right there. It's for math people. If anybody who's not a math person gets in there, just pummel them. Okay. Uh, sometimes other, other people just start taking that over, but please use it as math people so that there isn't any room for non-math people in there. Okay. <laughs> That's my uh, recommendation to you. Okay. Anything else? All right. Uh, I'll probably read names next time just so I start to kind of get names, but that's it. All right, guys. Any, any questions from you or is that, are you good? All right, see you guys later. Bye.